Two check check two. All right, come on in, folks. Get ready to start the service here. Take your seats, and we're going to be uh, starting the worship real soon. Trying to get all the technical things on screen. Praise God. Okay, yeah. Uh, just uh, say a prayer, Lord, and just prepare our hearts, Lord, to enter into praise and Lord, and just uh, forgive us, Lord, for the shortcomings and cleanse us, Lord, today in the precious blood of your Son. And just uh, we're asking you, Lord, we thank you for, for what you did on Calvary, Lord, and we just 
keep that in mind, you know, on this communion Sunday, we just you know, pray that we can go out in the joy of the Spirit. A lot of these songs talk about what Jesus did for us. Uh, the first one is rescue us. Uh, he rescued us from our sins and brought new life in you. So, so. He's our song we did last week uh, the praise is yours and uh, I had some uh, thoughts on that it kind of just covers from creation to what uh, Jesus did on the cross in culmination with when uh, Adam and Eve blew it back in the garden and uh, I just keep thinking of uh, the greatest commandment we all know what uh, loving God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and uh, obviously this is the greatest commandment because everything kind of flows from that, you know. If we love the Lord, we're going to obey him. If we love him, we're going to love others. And 
And so we just have to keep that paramount and we'll basically keep all the, uh, the Ten Commandments too. They would kind of flow out of that. This, this one's that all the praise is yours. <laughs> Celtic 
Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily enslaves us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. In the book of Hebrews, it speaks of those men and women who suffered because they would not compromise their faith. The Lord says to you, take for instance Moses, by faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing whether to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin. He is seeing that we culture Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, where he looked to the where he looked forward. And I say to you today, have you compromised? Have you allowed things in your life that is it doesn't go along with the word of God? And you have compromised today. Lay it on the altar. Lay it on the altar and, and turn to Jesus today because he wants us to win in this battle that we're in on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Look around you, says the Lord. And if you look around you, you will find no end to things to become angry about. Throughout this world, children are treated as if they are simply a commodity. People are confused because they've been forced into confusion. And there are so many things for us to become angry and distraught and even hateful over. But you have heard the words that vengeance is mine and I will repay, saith the Lord. So if I have restricted vengeance and repayment to myself, then what have I called you to? These are the words that I have called you to. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of thee? but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So I call you today to examine your hearts and see if there is any way there that you have become angry and even hateful. And better yet, ask me to search your heart to see if there is any unclean way there that you might be cleansed because you are the vessels through which the love of God will come to the evil of this earth. So do not allow your hearts to be clogged <coughs> with anger and hatred. I have not given those things to you, says the Lord, but love, mercy, and peace. For I hate sin. <coughs> I never, ever condone sin. And sin brings separation from me. The one thing that I want from my people, from all my people on the earth, is to be with me. I love them, whether they are following me or not. They are choosing their own path, and that is as it may be. I am doing what I will do to bring them to myself. But I have you to sin. I have you to show my love. I do not hate them. I hate the sin that is catching them up. The enemy who is binding them. Not the people who are caught up in, are prisoners of sin. They must be freed. They must be freed by my love and compassion. I hate sin, but I love them. Go in my name and love them for me. So. <laughs> As we 
uh, get ready to take communion this morning, just take a moment just to be quiet before the Lord, just in response to the words this morning, that the Lord would help us to not be quick to anger, to be forgiving, but also that he would help us to draw close to him, that we take communion, it's really all about that, it's about what he did to help us draw close to him and remembering the work that he did. So we're going to do that this morning. You guys can go ahead and bring forward the communion. We'll just take a moment just to be quiet before the Lord. opportunity we have again this morning just to reflect, uh, to think about your goodness and your faithfulness, to think about all the things that you have done in and through us, Lord. We're grateful for you. We're grateful for the cross this morning, Lord. I'm just going to read from Mark's account of the Last Supper this morning. Um, be a little bit simple this morning. We're just going to read and then we're just going to take communion. So Mark chapter 14. Starting with verse number 22, while they were eating, he took some bread and after blessing, he broke it and he gave it to them and said, take it. This is my body. And when he had taken the cup, he'd given thank and given thanks. He gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is being poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink of the, of the fruit of the vine again until the day when I drink it, drink it new in the kingdom of God. Mark's account's a little bit different than others. It's, he gets right to the point. This is my body. This is the blood of the new covenant. And I'm about to go. <laughs> the blood is going to be poured out for you. My body's going to be broken for you. And I'm not going to drink of this vine that we're sitting around the table eating this fruit and all these kind of things. I'm not going to have that again until I'm in heaven because I'm about to go with the Father. So you see this really powerful quick statement that he makes here. And I don't know if you guys have ever had time, maybe this is a practice we should all do, but every now and then sit around your table with your family at dinner time and take communion like they did here. Just a time of just remembering what he did and just a simple moment of eating. But for us, this is a something we do every month, but it's something we should never take for granted. It's something that when we do this, it should be a serious and sincere thing that I'm thinking about what he's done for me, that I'm really considering and pondering in my heart, not just in my mind, what he's accomplished for me and what he continues to do in me. And the fact that he constantly warned them, These are, this is what's happening. I'm about to go. This is the things I'm about to go through. But do this in remembrance of me. That's what we're doing this morning. So Lord, we thank you for this body that was broken for us. We pray today, Lord, in Jesus' name, that we would never take for granted what you've done for us, Lord. That every single day we would just acknowledge and recognize and not just passively go through this life, 
not considering what you've done. That when we tell our friends about you and our neighbors about you, we're telling them about the one who did these things, that you poured out your blood and that your body was broken. So we thank you that your body was broken for us this morning. Lord, we give you praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, you can take the bread. And Lord, we also thank you for this cup that was poured out for us, for the forgiveness of our sins. This act that you did is what allows us to draw close to you. None of us are perfect. We all have issues. Sin does separate us from you. But the blood of Christ creates a way for us to come close to you, even though we are sinful people. So we're grateful today that even though we're sinful people, Lord, we can come near to you and that you would come near to us and that we can walk with you and know you. And it's all because of this, the forgiveness of our sins, because of the blood that was poured out that we get to walk with you, Lord. We thank you for that today. We take this in remembrance of you, but also in honor of you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Jesus. Amen, amen. We're going to have the kids stand up. Pray for them as they get ready to go. Upstairs. They're going to the upper room. We'll spiritually go to the upper room while they're upstairs, but we'll be downstairs. We pray for the kids. Lord, we thank you for our amazing young children in this place today. We're praying today as they go upstairs that they have an incredible encounter with you today, Lord. That they have awesome time, that they have good fellowship and, and good connection with each other, but also, Lord, that they would just know you more today. Pray that they would not just hear your word, they would receive your word, Lord, and that they would fall in love with you more and more and more, we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You could take just a couple minutes to greet each other. Tell somebody you love them, maybe even that you like them. <laughs> oh, we'll do announcements once the kids are back, okay. gone. So. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. We're going to have a quick time of announcements, and we'll, we'll uh, do our prayer request while we're all together right before Pastor Chris speaks. Oh, you guys are so greedy this morning. With a T, not greedy. I know you love to greet each other. We all love each other. This is a great church family, so um, if you can just bear with me while I, while I uh, give announcements. Today, is a, um, today we're going to be signing up for... Uh, the, well, the ladies are going to be signing up for the women's retreat. You actually get to pick your room today, so it's an important, important thing. So uh, if you'd like to uh, see Carolyn immediately after the service, uh, they're going to be having a planning meeting after that. So if you can try to catch her right after the service and you can uh, sign up for the uh, women's retreat, all the information is on the front, so I won't, I won't, uh, I won't go through that. But if you could see Carolyn. Also, um, we have a birthday coming up this week. Somebody's going to be 93, Art like to celebrate with you a little bit early. You've been a great member of our church, and we are, we're so happy to, to, to have you with us and uh, to celebrate with you this, this miles, another milestone birthday for you. So happy birthday early. Also, while we're giving out good news, I'd like to call up uh, Ken Konwinski. He'd like to give us a quick update on his son, uh, Gabriel.
Yeah, it's been it's been quite a journey. We, we've been uh, kind of following along with him. If you've been following along with with uh, with his training, everything it's just an awesome thing. And yeah, fifteen guys out of one hundred and forty. I there was never a doubt in my mind. Just so you know, there was no doubt in my mind. I've uh, like I've known him. I've seen him. And it's funny. I was we 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 met we, we met a uh, a fella uh, uh, recently who was who who was a or who was a Navy SEAL. And I was trying to explain to him. I was like, oh, I I know this kid. And he's like, you know, I. I use the word stud, you know, it's like he's an athlete. He's like, oh, those guys always come in and blah, blah, blah. And he was trying to, I was like, yeah, but you don't know, you don't know this kid. <laughs> it's the wrong word. He's, he's, he's definitely set apart. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. So just keep him in your prayers. Okay. All right, speaking of prayers, let's, say, let's have our time of prayer request, and then we'll continue with our service. We do have a praise report, and I'll, I will do that first. This is uh, from Mickey. Thank you, for, Lord, for healing my shoulder. This is uh, f healing for Mark. Um, for a couple of people with lung diseases, for healing. Healing for my friend who was in a car accident this week. Um, healing for, uh, for Liz for, from childhood abuse. May God heal her mind and spirit. For um, Eric and Liz, may God bless their marriage, protect their three kids, and cause their family to flourish. He just begins to speak, but he also does through visions and dreams. So we know that uh, Amos chapter 1, verse 1, the word of Amos, which he, which he saw in a vision. So he had a vision that actually allowed him to hear the word of the Lord. You notice whenever there's a vision, there's somebody speaking. right? So it just kind of happens. The Lord is speaking through these kind of things. Um, and Jonah, the word of the Lord came to Jonah and gave him instruction on what he was supposed to be doing. Of course, he was a turd, and uh, <laughs> he caused all kinds of problems, and he had to deal with consequences of that. It's important that when the Lord comes to you, when the word of the Lord comes to you, whether it's like you hear the word of the Lord while you're praying, or, or God gives you a dream, or God gives you a vision, it's important that you don't just entertain it, but you actually contemplate it and consider it, and then do it. Right, be obedient to the Lord or whatever he's instructing you to do. You have to learn to hear the Lord and then respond in obedience. Um, so over and over and over again, I'm not going to keep reading. There's a lots of them. Over and over and over again throughout the entire Old Testament, you see this with prophets. And then you see it even in the New Testament happen. Um, the Holy Spirit is always looking for ears that will listen to what he is saying. Eyes that will look at what he is showing and a heart that would receive and respond to him. He's always looking. He's always speaking. He's always trying to reveal to us who he is. In, in the New Testament, in the Greek, you'll see the word dream when it's used regarding people who were given a dream by the Lord. It's not just that you're sleeping and that you hear something from the Lord, but it actually, uh, the connotation here is that um, it'll be bound up in your heart. So you have a dream that just sticks. When you know you have a dream from the Lord, it's one of those things that I woke up and it was like something that was different than I've experienced before. It wasn't just that I ate something weird. It wasn't just that I just like, you know, you ever have that happen where you have like the weirdest, craziest dreams that like make no sense and it was just indigestion. But there are times where you literally wake up from a dream and it is like, I know without a doubt this was from the Lord um, because it is bound up in my heart. So you're going to find out in these passages that we read um, Often the word dream is actually not just I slept and had a dream from the Lord, but it's I had a dream and it, it stuck in my heart. There are over 125 references to dreams or dreamers in the Bible. So take, take, take that into consideration. If it wasn't something that God does or was not important, would he actually talk about it 125 different times? It is something that happened, and it happened quite often. Um, prophets often dreamed, often had visions. But it wasn't just prophets. Of course, we're going to find out in just a minute there were... There are a lot of people who God can speak to through dreams. It's different than prophecy. So prophecy is a gift of the Holy Spirit, right? So you have to be saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, to be able to have the ability to prophesy. To have dreams, it's different. Because even people who are not saved will have dreams from the Lord. You see it in Scripture many times, but we're going to even talk about what that looks like um, in just a minute. But I actually had a conversation with this pastor this last week I was talking to um, regarding this very topic. And uh, he gave this... Um, the word heart, he used as an analogy. He said the word heart, if you look at the word heart, it has the word ear and the word hear in it. 
So you have an ear to hear, and then it gets into the heart and grips you, and then you begin to know. Remember last week when we heard the, the testimony last week, and he used this passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 24, 32, and I think this is really perfect for what we're talking about today. He said it's regarding the, the two men who were walking on the road in, and, and, um, and wrote in Emmaus, and they had this encounter with Jesus, right? They're having this conversation. And after they were walking away, they said, were our hearts not burning within us when he was speaking to us on the road? And I feel like that's how you, one of the ways that you know that you have had a dream or a vision from the Lord or that he has spoken to you, because when it happens, it grips your heart, and then you have this burning fire that is in, in you as a result of it to where it just won't leave you alone. Now, granted, it is important to know, just like prophetic words, dreams and visions, you'll know they come from the Lord when they line up with Scripture, right? We know that has to happen. Or not. He's not going to give you this wild dream that is completely not biblical and wacko. And you're like, that's from Jesus. No, it's not true. Um, sometimes you just have weird dreams. So there are times, though, when you have clear dreams from the Lord and they grip your heart and your heart is, is filled with passion because the Lord spoke to you. Whenever the Lord speaks to you, you just, I don't know how you guys are, but when I hear a clear word from the Lord, I get stirred. And I get fired up about it. And I'm ready to do what God says to do right now, no matter what. So I begin to just move, move, move towards that. And it's normal for that to happen. But it's also important to know that every time that God gives you a dream or a vision or even speaks to you or even gives you a prophetic word um, specifically for your life, uh, that doesn't mean it's going to happen today. And it doesn't mean it's going to happen the way that you thought it was going to happen. As a matter of fact, often it happens way different than what you expected it happened, but it still happens nonetheless. So I had a dream. Um, this was 2020, before, right before I came here, actually. Um, I think I told you a story before, but I had a dream specifically one night regarding the church that we were at in Minnesota merging with two other churches in the dream. First, they merged with another church that was... Uh, now, I'm, I'm going to use... Um, ethnic stuff just for a moment the two churches were pretty white and then a third church came along that was extremely multicultural you see you start seeing these merge I saw literally in the vision I saw the two churches come together and I saw a third church come in I didn't know what it looked like all I knew is the next morning that literally as I knew I heard from the Lord my heart was burning right it was one of those things that it was like it couldn't leave me it gripped me so all day long the next day I'm questioning God I'm like God what are you trying to do here um, I, I believe this is a word from you. I believe you're speaking to me, but how do you go about this? Like, do I just go, go to churches and, how are you doing today? Do you want to merge? <laughs> you know, like, it's not, it's not necessarily how it works. So I'm praying all day long, and I'm like asking the Lord over and over and over again, and finally, um, the Lord actually just gave me a specific church, because he'll do that. So I contact this pastor not knowing anything about them necessarily other than I looked at their doctrinal statements and they were pretty close. I'm like, okay, so you know what you're doing there, Lord. Like, he doesn't know what he's doing all the time. So I, I contacted him. I sent him a message. He sent me a message back saying that he had been praying for several years regarding a merger, but also that he had resigned and he's leaving in a week. The church doesn't have a pastor. And so I'm like thinking, that's perfect because our church does have one, right? So it's perfect because in your mind, you're just trying to put the pieces together. And so we end up starting having conversations. These conversations went on for several weeks, and at the same time that I'm having these conversations, then things start happening over here in Michigan. And I'm, I start getting, like, messed with by the Lord. <laughs> so he starts doing that sometimes. In case you know, you've got to stay on your toes with the Lord. You've got to stay, have the ability to really hear him and listen. But long story short, two churches merged. After we had moved on, those two churches merged. Differently than I expected, because I expected I, would, I was going to be there and pastor the two churches, and eventually another church would come on. But even since then, the, things have changed in the churches that merged. There are some people who stuck, some people who left, new people who have come. You know, it's kind of one of those things that happens. But now they're in the process of merging with a multicultural church. It's way different than I ever expected it to happen. I, I, I mean, you remember me talking about years ago that I, there was three churches. I kept saying there's three churches. I don't know why it's just two right now, but there's three churches, and one is very multicultural. And forever I kept thinking this, this is going to happen. And when we left, I'm like, this is not happening at all the way I expected. So maybe I missed God at least on half of it. And now all of a sudden it's all happening, and you're seeing it take place. It's way different than I expected. But yet God still was faithful to his word that he gave, right? So don't expect that when you have a dream or a vision or God speaks to you, that it's always going to be exactly the way that you expect it. Just know that if it is from the Lord, um, as long as we are faithful and obedient, because that's important, 
I mean, sometimes what God speaks to you requires your obedience for it to happen, right? If you're disobedient to the Lord, then what's going to happen is he's, he's still going to do something. He's just going to have to go around you and around us in order to get to that point sometimes because he requires our obedience. And so sometimes it ends up being delayed, right? I do, I'm not obedient to the Lord, so the things that he wants to do, he just delays it until I come in line and begin to be obedient to him. So it's, there's a lot of variables. You gotta, it's important for us to understand that. So we're going to go through different people um, and different um, people who had dreams in scriptures. And I'm going to just share a little bit about them before I get into the actual scriptures for, the t- for today. Um, so Abimelech in Genesis 23 had a dream where it says, I had a dream and in the dream he said, Indeed, you are a dead man. The woman you have taken is another man's wife, and so God gave him a warning. So there's one of the reasons why God will give you a dream or a vision is no different than why he'd give you a prophetic word. One of the reasons is he's going to warn you about things that you're doing or the destruction that you're causing on, on your own. So sometimes we need to be put back in line so the Lord will give us a dream to say, hey, you stupid. Like, anybody have those moments where the God speaks to you says, hey, you stupid? Yeah, I've had those too many times. So... Uh, I try, I try not to have them often, but like once a week is about what I usually get, <laughs> once a week at least. And so I'm used to it by now. Uh, in Genesis chapter 28, verse 10, 13, Jacob has a dream. I am the Lord your God, Abraham, um, of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. And so he's introducing himself, he's, he's, and he goes on to encourage him in this passage. So sometimes you get an encouragement from the Lord um, when he gives you a dream, and it's important that we get encouraged sometimes. Um, so over and over and over again, we see these different reasons why Joseph has his dreams. Joseph's dreams caused, caused a lot of problems, right? He had dreams, and his dreams were of, of his brothers and his parents even bowing down before him. And he shared the dreams with them, and they're all flipping out because, like, who do you think you are, right? Like, you had these dreams, and you think that you're special. But ultimately, the dreams he had happened. Everything God said was going to happen, it just happened in a different way than it was expected. He probably, when he had those dreams, didn't expect he would be a slave, afterwards, right? He expected that immediately I'm going to tell my mom and dad and my brothers and sisters about this dream and they're all going to bow right now (laughs) because I'm awesome. And when I give them my dream, they'll be like, you heard from the Lord, (laughs) right? That's, that's not how it happened. Instead, they get angry. They throw him into slavery. They sell him into slavery. He goes and becomes a slave. And then while he's a slave, God begins to give him opportunities to be the man of God that he is. And so he's faithful and obedient over and over and over again. This goes back to what I said. Faithfulness and obedience to God will cause God to, to, all those things will come to pass. He just sometimes will put us through a process in order to get there. So this is what took place with Joseph. He had, was given, and it's, this is what's going to happen. And these are, there's going to be awesome things that I'm going to do in you. And these things are going to happen. But what he didn't tell him is what he had to do. So sometimes you'll get like these, I have a word for you. God, you ever have that happen where someone gives a word for you? Like God's going to do this in your life, this amazing thing. And then you're like, awesome. And then like three years later, you're like, it hasn't happened yet. I'm kind of annoyed. It's a false prophet. Doesn't mean that they were a false prophet necessarily. It just meant it's not yet. Or maybe I need to check my own heart and make sure that I'm lined up, that I'm being faithful and obedient like Joseph was, because I want to make sure that I'm in position to where he can do what he said he's going to do. So he gives us a lot of different words. But we also see people he gave dreams to like Pharaoh. Was Pharaoh following the Lord? God at that time. Pharaoh was not, but he still had a dream, and then he was given interpretation later on, but he was not a man of God. He was, matter of fact, he was a pain in the neck to people who were men of God, and yet he was given a dream. So it goes back to what I said earlier, dreams and visions sometimes will just come to anybody because God will sometimes, um, as a matter of fact, I think there's one really good passage I'm going to read um, that kind of gives us an example of that in just a minute. So I'll get to that in just a minute because I think it's important to understand that God speaks to everybody. There's not a single person he doesn't. So in Genesis chapter 20, verse 3 through 7, um, I already read that, never mind. I'm going to go to this. Passage in Acts chapter 2. This is our main passage, so I'm just going to get right to it for time reasons. Time reasons. So Acts chapter 2, verse 14 through 17. This is the upper room. We talked about this a month ago. It's been a while. I feel like, like, do you remember a month ago sermon? Probably not. We talked about prophetic. We talked about the last days. Now, granted, you got to understand in this passage in Acts, um, Peter, when he speaks here, he's speaking of the moment that he's in. So the last days were at that moment. From that time on, the last days have been. So we're, God's timing is just different than ours. So the last days is just ever since Jesus was 
crucified and resurrected. Now we're in the last days, and so we're in this time period. So Peter was speaking about that moment and his prophecy fulfilled in that moment, but we're in that moment as well. So in verse 14, he says, but Peter, taking his stand with the other eleven, this is after he had the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the upper room, he raised his voice and declared to the men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, know this and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you assume, because anybody who's filled with the Spirit must be drunk. That's just logical if you're in the world. Since it is only the third hour of the day, but this is what has been spoken through the prophet Joel, in, and it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour out my Spirit on, what's the next word? All mankind, all flesh. It means everybody. It means if you're alive, when he's pouring out his Spirit, uh, he's going to give, come, come to people who are saved and unsaved. Uh, granted, us who are filled with the Spirit, we're going to constantly get refreshing of the Holy Spirit, constant fillings of the Holy Spirit because we've received the Holy Spirit, so we're being filled. That doesn't mean that it's not being poured out on, right? So it, it's different. You're filled with the Holy Spirit, then you're constantly being filled, constantly being refreshed. If you don't know the Lord, the Holy Spirit is still going to come upon you over and over and over again trying to draw you to Him and trying to speak to you, trying to give you revelation, trying to help you understand. And as you read the next parts of this passage, it says, and your sons and daughters. So who does he speak to? First, it's all people. Then it's sons and daughters. They will prophesy. Then it's young and old will dream visions and have, have. So it's pretty much he covers all the bases, right? It's all. Then it's sons and daughters. Then it's young and old. So no matter who you are, if you are alive, if you are young, if you are old, if you are a man or you're female, you will have the opportunity to have encounters with the Lord. And he will pour out his spirit on you and he will give you, he'll speak to you in your prayer closet. He'll speak to you through his word. He'll give you dreams and visions. It will happen. And I think sometimes I wonder why does he give you dreams and visions when he could just speak to you through the word and just speak to us in general, right? Why would he give his dreams and visions? Part of that is because we don't listen, right? Sometimes he has to put us in a position. We'll read that in a minute in Job where it's very clear. This is why he gave a vision. Um, Acts chapter 9, we see the encounter that Paul had or Saul had with Jesus. That was a vision an encounter. Uh, nobody else who was with him saw what he was seeing. They heard the voice, but they didn't see it. So he was not a believer. He was on the road to Damascus, and then bam, there he was, a big white light knocked him off his horse, and he heard the word. He had his encounter with the Lord. Why did God do that? Because Saul was not listening. He was stubborn. He was arrogant. He was not listening, but by giving him a vision, he opened his eyes, and he gave his life to Jesus, right? He began to follow him and wrote most of the New Testament. So God will give visions for that reason. We've heard about the stories of Muslims having dreams all over the, all over the world, really, but especially throughout the Middle East, they're having dreams of Jesus. And many of them have talked about these dreams that they've had where it literally shows up in, in front of them, kind of like we've seen happen with different people in Scripture, like Gideon, where he's just there and all of a sudden there's an angel, right? So you have these encounters, but they're having these encounters and they're hearing about Jesus and they're being warned if they don't turn their life around and give their life to Christ. So they're given, they're given warnings, they're given opportunities through vision. So he will speak to every single person um, in order to draw people to Jesus. That's really the reason why. He's, or, that's, the, that's the goal of why he will pour out his spirit. That's, a, that's the goal of why he'll give dreams and visions to those who don't know him. Job 33, verse 14 through 18. Indeed, God speaks once or twice, yet no one notices it. In a dream of vision of, of the night... When deep sleep falls on people while they slumber in their beds, then he opens up the ears of people and horrifies them with warnings so that they may turn, so they may turn a person away from bad conduct and keep a man from pride. He keeps his soul back from the pit and his life from perishing by the spear. So in other words, what he's saying here in Job is that because you all don't listen, that I have to get you to a point where you're sleeping when you don't have a say in what's happening. Like you're sleeping, you don't get to say what's going on, you don't get to dictate what's going on, right? You get busy, you don't want to listen to the Lord. The Lord's trying to tell you do this or do that, but you're stubborn, so you're not listening because this is my way, this is how I want to do things, or, or I'm just too busy to hear. So the Lord's like, okay, fine. I told you once, I told you twice, wait till you fall asleep. <laughs> wait, just wait till you fall asleep. And you have those moments where you're sleeping, and you have, I've had those dreams, I've had those moments where... Um, I freaked out as a result of the dream that I was taking place, but he will give you these dreams in order to help us to come back in line, in order to show us who he is. So one of the reasons why he gives dreams is specifically because we don't listen. And by the way, this happens not just to unbelievers, but to believers. There are people who are following Jesus that you literally are just so stuck in 
uh, and your, your path, the things that you're doing. You're so busy. You're so, but you also have your way of thinking that you don't want to listen to that. So the Lord will like totally mess with you when you're sleeping and give you a dream in order to get you back over here. Get back to the narrow path. Right, So we get that kind of moments we have that. Another reason why he gives dreams is to reveal purpose and calling. In Numbers chapter 12, Miriam and Aaron are causing problems for Moses. And so they're causing problems for Moses, give, getting on his case and all that kind of stuff. And so the Lord shows, shows up and starts begin to speak, begins to speak to them. And in that conversation that's happening, I'm not going to get into all that conversation, but I'm just going to share one part in verse number six. It says, if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak, to speak with him in a dream. So in other words, if there's somebody here who is a prophet, if somebody's legitimately a prophet, I'm going to speak to them through visions and dreams, which we've seen all throughout the Old Testament. Prophets constantly were having moments where they were taken away in vision, moments where they were given, given dreams while they slept. Um, it's a constant thing, and it, it's true. God will say, I will speak to them, and I'll do it this way. And so one of the reasons why he'll give um, visions and dreams is for that reason, to give purpose and calling. Because, again, it goes back to what I just said a minute ago. I think the reason why is because sometimes we don't listen. So I can be attentive to the Holy Spirit, praying, listening, worshiping, and he can reveal his purpose to me while I'm still awake without a dream. Then I could just go do it. But if I'm stubborn, he might show me in a dream what he's doing. In Acts chapter 16, you see him giving direction in dream in a vision. Paul, in Acts chapter 16, in verse number 1, I'll read. Now, Paul also came to Derbe and Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, and the son of, son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek, and he was well spoken of by the brothers and sisters who were in Lystra. In I, I call it Iconium, am I right? It's, it's whatever. It's a word. <laughs> so Paul wanted this man to leave with him. And he took him and he circumcised him because of the Jews who were in, the, in those parts. In other words, those Jews who were in those parts, including Christian Jews, were forcing you. If you got saved, you still had to get circumcised. They were still under the an old covenant way of thinking. And that's what's happening in this passage. Because of those people, he had Timothy circumcised just to avoid issues. Now, while they were passing through the cities... They were delivering the ordinances for, for, for them to follow, which had been determined by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. They passed through. Uh, so now what's going to happen is they're passing through different places. They're beginning to speak the word of the Lord. So I'm going to go down a little bit because that's what's taking place. So as they're going to all these places and they're going different places and speaking, the Lord just keeps denying them. Like, you can't go here, you can't go here, you can't go here. And while they're in the process of trying to figure out where to go, in verse number 9, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia, Macedonia was standing and pleading with him and saying, come over here to Macedonia and help us. So you have this vision of this man saying, hey, so you're, you're being blocked from all of these places, and all of a sudden you have a vision saying, hey, this man saying, hey, come here and help us. Well, what do you do? Paul didn't hesitate. This is an important message for every one of us right now. That when the Lord speaks, you don't need to wait. You don't need to hesitate. We all want to wait. Because that, that's, that's me. That's how I operate. No, when the Lord speaks, you don't wait. You move immediately. When he has seen this, the vision, we immediately sought to leave from Macedonia in concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel there to, the, to them. Now, this is important because Paul probably got excited he gave us a clear word. We're going to go there. We're going to preach the word. He did not know what was going to happen when he got there. He got imprisoned with Silas, right? Remember the story? He goes and gets imprisoned. He gets in trouble because he cast out a spirit of a woman who was a fortune teller. So he, he's used by God. He connects with one of the most prominent women in Scripture, Lydia, while he's there. And it has really cool stuff to have. She's converted, and she becomes a very big part of uh, providing for his ministry for over the years. So he had really cool things that happened, but then he got arrested. So he had this encouraging, exciting direction from the Lord in a dream. He goes immediately to do it, and then it came with trouble. I say that because anytime we're obedient to the Lord, it does often come with trouble. Because we live in a world that is sinful, and there's a lot of trouble. It's important. Just because trouble happens doesn't mean it wasn't the Lord. Right? right? Remember that. It's not always going to happen the way you think it's going to happen. I just have to hear have an ear to hear, 
and then let it get to the heart. Ear, hear, heart. Remember that phrase. That's going to be really good. Just remember that. Write it down. It's good for you. So he will, he will reveal Jesus. He will encourage us with dreams. He will give us direction with dreams. He will give us warnings with dreams. He will give us our purpose with dreams and visions. All these things will happen. In Judges chapter 6, you remember we talked about this not that long ago, Gideon was in the wine vat hiding from the Midianites because he's a sissy. And uh, no, <laughs> I, I probably would hide in that wine vat too with, based on what they were doing. They were destroying them. They were kind of constantly on their case and they were stealing from them all their crops. And so what is he, he went to a wine vat because that's the natural place to, to go thresh wheat. So that's what he's doing. <laughs> and uh, he's in this wine vat threshing wheat. And while he's in the wine vat threshing wheat hiding, he ends up having this encounter with the angel that, that gives him like a weirdest word ever, right? Mighty warrior, he called him, as he was hiding in the wine vat. That makes sense. You're a mighty warrior because you're hiding. But he has that encounter. But even after that, you remember we talked about how um, even after that happened, he questioned God. And he gave out these fleeces. God, can you please prove it to me? And then God did. God, can you please prove it to me? And then God did. Well, in Judges chapter 7, which is only the next chapter, he still had to be convinced probably because they had been oppressed for such a long time and it was so difficult and so hard, it is very hard sometimes for us to get confident, right? Because I've experienced so many things that have been difficult, it's hard to hear the Lord or respond to the Lord. Um, in the middle of this, he said all these cool things and I'm supposed to go do them and it's hard to do, but is he really going to do it? Like, am I really capable of doing this? Right? He gives direction for a reason. When Judges chapter 7, verse 13, when Gideon came, behold, a man was relating a dream to his friend. And he said, Behold, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread was tumbling into the camp of Midian, and it came to the tent and struck it so that it fell, and turned it upside down so that the tent collapsed. And his friend replied, This is nothing other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has handed over to him Midian and all the camp. So even after God sent an angel and said, This is what's going to happen, and then he answered the fleece, and then he answered the fleece. This goes to the stubbornness that we all have, right? This goes to the fear that we sometimes walk in, that the Lord speaks to us, gives us direction. The Lord speaks to us and gives us encouragement. The Lord speaks to us and gives us purpose and a plan and all these kind of things, and we hear it, and we know for sure because our hearts are burning when we hear the word of the Lord. So we know it's the Lord, but yet still, God prove it, God prove it, God prove it. And then he had to have somebody send a dream in chapter 7 to say, this is what's going to happen. Now, finally, Gideon, when Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship. Then he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has handed over to you the camp of Midian. It took an angel. It took two, two fleeces, really, back to back. And then it took somebody. It finally was a dream that convinced him. So the Lord gives dreams to encourage, because that's what happened here. He was still struggling with it. He's like, Fine, finally going to give you one more. A person who has nothing to do with what you've been experiencing with the angel, doesn't know what's going on, but they've had a dream that confirms everything. I don't know if you've had that happen before, but like the Lord's speaking to you over here, and, and you're like questioning it, and he just keeps showing you, and you keep questioning it. And then God sends somebody that's, that has no idea what God's been showing you. And they might have just a word from the Lord, or maybe it's a dream, whatever it is. And they confirm it in you, and at that point in time, you stand up with confidence. Because, wait a minute, there's, they didn't know what was going on. They didn't know that the Lord had spoken to me these, these things. And that's exactly what takes place here. So he confirms and he gives encouragement through dreams and visions in order for us to continue to be obedient. So years ago, I'm saved at 17-ish years old. And I have a family that was mostly non-believers. So I, I, my first year and a half of being saved was intense. It was, I, I, I think all of us experienced this, but I had this warfare that was going on that was so intense that I really started questioning whether, you know, I'm like, I'm serving the Lord. I gave him everything. I'm two years in now, and it's like crazy. And now I'm called into ministry, and I feel like I'm called, and I'm starting to pursue those things. And as it happens, I just start having bombardment of warfare that is new to me. Right? When you're newly saved, warfare is new to you. Now, I'm seasoned. <laughs> I'm very seasoned in warfare now. Uh, it comes all the time because the enemy hates you and he hates me and he hates what God wants to do in and through us. And so because of that, he will try to deter us. He'll try to discourage us. So when God speaks to us or God gives dreams and visions, all he's doing is trying to get us to ignore what the enemy's doing and to listen to him and to be obedient. That's really what it's all about. So I, I, in my upstairs of my mom and dad's home, there was this, uh, this you ever, anybody know what a bungalow looks like? So we lived in a two-bedroom bungalow with a lot of people, way too many people. 
The upstairs was only had like, they had, I can't explain it. I wish I should have gotten pictures. But it was like that knotty pine wood. It was finished, but it was not completely finished. It was like one big room, except there was a, so in my bedroom, just imagine where I'm standing, there was a bed here. There was a wall right next to the bed that went into an attic, but there was a wall. And there was a door that went into the attic. Um, and over here, there was a ledge that you can look over to go downstairs because it was wide open. We didn't have any doors or anything. And so there's, and then straight ahead, so we'll call that back wall, Bosons, you're the back wall. <laughs> I'm going to call you the door of the back wall that leads into the bathroom. So there's this door that led into a bathroom straight ahead. I had, I had to go that way and then turn this way in order to leave the room. So I couldn't just, or I could be like really athletic and just jump over the ledge. I might have done that a few times when I was little. But you turn to the left, and when you turn to the left, you're walking this way, and then there's a big wide open space over to the right, and there's a big window, and there's, it's bigger where there's another bed and things like that because we all slept in the same rooms. You have big families and small houses. You have like four or five people in a room at sometimes, and you have to share with your little sisters, which is annoying. So, so you're in this big open space over here, and over this way there's another door, which is a walk-in closet that had two attic doors on each side when you walked in. So it's this big closet. And then to the left, there's a stairway and another closet there. I had to explain this to you because of a dream that I had. And this dream was wild. I'm in the middle of the spiritual warfare. It's crazy. And it was the most, still to today, it's one of the most crazy experiences I've ever had because I'm, I'm, I fall asleep, I'm dreaming. And in this dream, I woke up in my bed. And I'm starting to leave, like, to go downstairs or whatever. And as I'm getting up to walk, that door, this is you guys back there, that bathroom door is, like, lit up a little bit, like, but dark like red, it's a little bit of smoke coming out of it. And I'm trying to walk to go downstairs, and these, these demonic beings were coming out of the room and grabbing a hold of me to not let me go where I was trying to go. And I'm, it's, it becomes an intense battle for me trying to get free. I wake up, literally wake up in my bed, and I'm in a cold sweat. I'm like, I'm, I'm like it's fearful in this dream. So I'm like scared, I'm freaking out. And so then after that happened, I, um, I, I waited a little while, fell back asleep, and when I fell back asleep, my dream continued from that spot. I got free from them, but started walking this way, and now that closet I mentioned over here, the same thing took place. They're coming out, and they're grabbing a hold of me, and they're trying to pull me in or whatever, trying to stop me from going where I wanted to go. I wake up again in a cold sweat, freaking out again. And now I'm, like, really tripping, because, like, like, dreams don't just continue. There's sometimes I've had dreams where, like, man, that was a great dream. I wish it wasn't over. Can I go back to sleep and have it? No, you can't. You go back to sleep, and you're not going to dream about that anymore. But I go back to sleep again, and my dream continues from the same spot. Now I'm turning towards the, the, the stairway, and there's another closet, and it's the same exact thing out of that closet. They're coming and trying to stop me, but this is what happens now. Now they're coming from every direction. From every room, they're coming, and they have me surrounded. And I, I, can, I can still remember. This is like 25 20 years ago, maybe longer. I still, right now, as I'm talking about it, can remember how I felt. That's how intense this was. So I'm sitting there freaking out in the dream as they're coming against me. There's nothing I can do, but all of a sudden, through the big, giant window, we had a huge window upstairs, it, a big, bright, white light comes through the window, and literally Jesus enters the room. And as Jesus comes into the room, and he comes to me, and comes right to me, and gives me a hug, um, immediately, they scattered. And all of the darkness and everything just went away. I woke up feeling peace the next morning, not, not right away. And I say that because immediately the Lord gave me a scripture that I didn't, wasn't familiar with, and it was, let God arise, and your enemies be scattered. And he began to speak to me about spiritual warfare and what I was dealing with. Um, and so the Lord began to use dreams in order to show me, this happens, you're now involved in spiritual things, and now that you're involved with the Lord and you're connected to the Lord, you can see what was always going on, you just couldn't see it before. You couldn't recognize it before. So now I understood the battle that I was in. I understood steps that I needed to take um, to fight and win battles, right? Prayer, fasting, things of that nature that I needed to start doing um, that I wasn't doing before. So dreams and visions are real. God can show you amazing, incredible things through that. I'm going to end with this. You all know in Acts chapter 10, there was this guy who was the Italian. We talked about him before. Remember the Italian Cornelius with a big trunk um, in his car? So he was a mobster. I'm just assuming that mobsters were around back then. But Cornelius has, who's, who's, a, who's a man who is a Gentile, but believed in the God of the Jews, right? The God of Jacob, Isaac, and you know, you know all the story. You guys know what he believed. But he wasn't a Christian. 
So he was a, a devout man, and he believed, and he, the Bible says he like, gave gifts to the Jews, and he donated to the Jews. So he was a devout man. Well, this man, Cornelius, has a vision, and in his vision, he's given instruction to go to Peter. And so he's like, I'm, I'm going to do what this vision said. It was really strong, really powerful, so I'm going to go to Peter. Then Peter, on the other hand, he's on the roof of a house, and Peter begins to have a vision from the Lord. And the Lord, Lord gives him a very clear vision, and his vision was, when they come to your house, let them in. Accept them. Listen to them. Speak to them. So what happens as a result of two men having a vision, one who was a not a believer, one who was a believer, they came together in one place. Peter began to share the gospel. Cornelius gets saved. All the people in the house get saved. They then get baptized, and then the Holy Spirit falls upon all of them. The Bible says literally the same exact experience that happened with the, the Jewish believers at Pentecost now happened with these Gentiles. And it happened as a result of two people having visions and then responding in obedience to what the Lord spoke to them in those visions. Now, later on in Acts chapter 15, they're having uh, an issue because this is how important that we pay attention to what God does. God works. His, there's an order, a structure to what God does. All of a sudden, Acts chapter 15, the church is faced with a group of people who are Jews who are preaching that every single person who is saved still needs to get circumcised. We need, we need you to, to so follow Jewish law. And so there's this debate going on back and forth about this. So Peter comes in Acts chapter 15 and says, don't you remember back in Acts chapter 10 when, I don't think he used the word back in Acts chapter 10, but, uh, but you remember back then when I explained to you guys all this dream that I had? And then the, the, a division that I had and the vision that this guy Cornelius had that we came together and that God saved all these people who were Gentiles and he filled them with the Holy Spirit. Remember that crazy encounter? And then he began to say that, that we should not put anything else on them. The burden of these things should be gone. The law is past. It's not where we're at anymore. He began to speak to them. And then, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, that, that Peter is reminding him all these things, and then James is reminded of Scripture. So James is like, yeah, you know, remember the Scripture where it talked about Gentiles being saved and this kind of thing happening? Remember that passage? He began to share it, and then everybody started be, beginning to agree. But I love this phrase that happens um, in verse number 28 of Acts chapter 15. After they discussed it, after Peter reminded them of a dream, after James reminded them of the prophetic scriptures, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from acts of sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will, you, you will, you will do well. Farewell. That simple. It all happened because somebody had a vision, and another person had a vision, and then they were reminded of that vision in, this, in chapter 15, and then somebody else is reminded of the Scripture as a result of this conversation. See how that works? Like the, the vision, the vision, the Scripture all comes together, and they're like, wait a minute. We were thinking about this all wrong. It's funny how being attentive to the Holy Spirit and listening to Him can even change the way I see certain Scriptures. There's times where I've wrestled with Scriptures. I'm like, I have no idea what this is talking about. And then Holy Spirit begins to speak. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> the dots begin to connect, right? It's important that we learn to hear the voice of God, but also be aware uh, that, that God speaks to your dreams and visions. You might have had them, and then you just ignored them. Like, that was a really wild dream. It seemed like it was legitimate, like, like maybe, but then you just discount it. Don't discount it. One, one word I heard from somebody a while back who maybe one of the most... He operates in the prophetic like nobody, I've, I, I, there's a couple people I, I know, but operates in the prophetic in, in crazy ways. But, um, but I heard this phrase, my wife goes to this conference and they give this prophetic word. And the word was this, it was simple. This is the word, she didn't like it. She told me I didn't like it. <laughs> so, so we're like, we don't like it. <laughs> Therefore, it's not true. <laughs> you know, like, like, <laughs> that's just not the kind of word I was expecting to happen. And they gave this phrase, and I'll give you this phrase this morning. When the Lord speaks to you in prayer, when maybe a dream, maybe a vision, maybe you feel something the Lord is speaking to you to share with somebody else, but it doesn't sit well with you right now, set it on a shelf. Don't throw it away, because that's what we do. We throw it away because I don't like it. But set it on a shelf, and then watch it. Over time, God will begin to show you. And all of a sudden, you're like, three years later, hmm, I hated it, but now it's happening. Now, I, I, now I'm encouraged because I know you ever have that happen where all of a sudden the Lord brings it back and you're like, wait a minute. So now it's encouraging because now you realize the Lord is speaking to me directly. To me, that's encouraging. Even if it's a bad thing or not bad because God doesn't give bad, He just sometimes does things that um, 
stirs us up a little bit or causes us to have to press in a little more or, or just direction for our lives that we didn't like necessarily. But when it happens, you're like, the Lord cares enough to give somebody else a word for me that maybe didn't happen today, but three years later, here it is happening. And it's instruction, it's direction, it's caring that he does these things. And so even though sometimes it's warnings and even though sometimes it's hard, hearing from the Lord is essential for a believer. It is very difficult to follow somebody you don't listen to. Right? Especially since, like, we're blind. <laughs> Without him, we're blind. Remember, he has to take the scales off our eyes. So, like, we're following him. We have to learn to listen to him, to see him, and then respond in obedience to him. Because when I don't, I bring delay and frustration. But when I do, there's blessing and there's all kinds of crazy, awesome things I get to see God do. As a result, they saw it. Read the book of Acts, man. It's wild, the things that happen as a result of obedience to the Lord as he spoke to them. Amen. Come on, kind of, we're going to sing in, in closing and pray. Uh, if you have any need for prayer today, again, as always, the altars are open. We want to pray with you, and um, we're available to you for anything you want prayer for, so whatever it might be. Lord, we thank you today right now for your word. We thank you for the fact that we get to hear you, Lord that you don't just save us, but Lord, you constantly walk with us. We can hear your voice. We can listen to you. Lord, I thank you for the dreams, the visions that I've had that have been um, many times frustrating. And, and, then, and then later on, seeing what you've done, they've brought more peace to me and more comfort to me because I recognize that you know all the things I don't. And sometimes we hear a word from you or we even hear you speak to us in our own prayer times. And what we hear, we don't necessarily like, but we don't realize that you see the whole picture. You've already been to the end. We have not, and so we don't see it all, so we get frustrated. Lord, help us to listen, including to those things that are frustrating or difficult to hear. Lord, change our hearts, draw us closer to you. Help us to walk very, in the day that we live in, where we acknowledge right now that we need to walk closely with you. There are too many voices trying to get our attention. Lord, I pray that we would learn to lean into you so we'd hear you clearly. Your word says that you're sheep will know your voice. Help us to know your voice today, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.